Hey guys, Three and Out has its own YouTube channel and we plan on doing coward type numbers. Here's the key. If you're watching this, you like our content, make sure you subscribe. Subscribe to the page, leave a comment, interact with our stuff. We do stuff on this page on a daily basis. 365, Three and Out podcast right here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe right now. Okay, let's go into some questions. Middlecoff Mailbag, at John Middlecoff. Fire in those DMs, Instagram. If you're in the Niners front office, what are three moves you're making for next season? When talking about Brock Purdy's value to the team in comparison to the supreme scheme and roster around him, how come nobody mentions that his play single-handedly saved the jobs of the schemer and roster builder builder via the Lance fiasco? Uh, I, I just think we live in a world, and I'm guilty of this too, we're just on to the next thing. Like, no one talks, Trey Lance is completely irrelevant. He, he just is. You know, since Trey Lance has been drafted by the 49ers, the Niners have been to two NFC championships, and they're currently 11-4. and four. So that's the great part about the NFL, right? You, you just move on. It, 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 works at, it works at rapid speed. The best part of the NFL is urgency, 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 and we're on to the next thing. Like, the only thing that matters for the 49ers now is the Washington Commander game at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on Sunday. Trey Lance is such a distant memory of just irrelevance, even though it is one of the worst trades of all time. Uh, But I hear you. But I also think comparing yourself to a guy that is a third stringer in the NFL is a pretty low bar. And, you know, this is not George Steinbrenner or Al Davis. Jed York loves these guys. So even if it hadn't been as smooth, now if they had sucked, yeah, maybe they ended up getting fired, but... I think they were on a lot longer leash than people realize. Like ultimately Trey Lance to Jed York is just whatever, you know, it's $25 million signing bonus. Move on. Let's who cares. Uh, I, I think they're just still going to be question marks with Brock Purdy playing the best teams on defense. Can he elevate? And so far this year, it hasn't gone smoothly. Now Trey Lance would have no chance. I mean, the, the Niners would, I don't even think make the playoffs if Trey Lance was starting quarterback. Yeah, I just don't think he can play. But comparing him to Trey Lance is kind of an irrelevant exercise, in my opinion. If you're the Niners front office, what are the three moves you're making? I think you have to figure out Eric Armstead. You know, he makes a ton of money, and he's like the team captain. They call him the blueprint in the organization. But when you make $15, $16, 17000000 million, and you're old and injured a lot, you know, this is football. This isn't, you know, you got to separate emotions. I mean, the best two coaches of my life, Walsh and Belichick were just cutthroat. So how do you balance that? And, you know, whether you, will you come back and play for four or $5 million? Cause we'll take it, but we can't pay you this. And that leads into Brandon Ayuk, who is a stud and you got to keep, but he's a 20 plus million dollar player. So can you pay Brandon Ayuk? Can you have Brandon Ayuk and Debo making a combined, you know, $50 million. Now, because of the way the cap works, it doesn't exactly equal that on the salary cap, but Debo's salary cap hit next year is huge. So I think you need to improve the offensive line and the defensive line beside Bosa this year just hasn't been good enough. It just simply hasn't been good enough. And I think talent wise, they're just not as good. The Drake Jackson has been a whiff. I mean, they kind of whiffed on the draft a couple years ago. Ty Davis price on the practice squad. Drake Jackson can't play. And Danny Gray just, got passed by Ronnie Bell in the blink of an eye. Other than that, one big picture thing that's looming for the 49ers is Trent Williams is 35, 36 years old. It's like, he's not going to play forever. And they're never going to draft high enough to get one of the sweet left. How do you ever replace him? I mean, the only reason you got Trent Williams is because he refused to get traded to the Vikings and wanted to play for his dude, Kyle Shanahan. It's the only reason they got him. The Vikings offered a better deal. And Trent Williams like, no, I refuse. I'll just stay retired. <laughs> I mean, which benefits of Niners, like Kyle's relationship with them. But there was a lot, a lot of luck involved with that. Let's not act like it. He's like, no one was on Trent Williams. Or the Niners stole him. No, not really the way it happened. <laughs> Huge fan of the pod. I like this guy already. Two questions here from a struggling Bronco fan. First, how is it that Russ looks like he's barely worth being a starter for the first three quarters of a game, then completely tears it up in the fourth quarter? Is it because he just constantly going off script in a hurry-up offense, or is there another reason? 
Finally, what did the Broncos do about the quarterback in the offseason? I like Russ as a guy, but I don't think I can watch him play another year. Well, I don't think he'll have to. I, I don't think he's on the team next year. Uh, now, how that is facilitated, a cut, a trade, where they eat a bunch of money, I, I don't know. But I, I would not envision Russell Wilson being on the Denver Broncos next year. Uh, I, I think it's over. And it's going to be pretty ugly divorce, you know, financially for the Broncos and the hit on the salary cap, but I, I think they'll pivot. Uh, I think that much is pretty clear. I think it happens in the NFL a lot when you just kind of play free, like you've got nothing to lose. It's like you stick to the game plan, you know, and, and you get very, very stuck in your ways. And then you're like, fuck it. Let's just let it rip. And then all of a sudden you play more free. Uh, it, it happens all around the league constantly, especially if a team's down like 20 points and then the final score is like, oh, they only lost by six. It's like, yeah, that game was not close. Um, I'd be lying. I was, you know, Christmas festivities were going on. I tried to kept running back to the TV. I just think, I, I said this the other day. He even people that tried to prop him up, like Sean Payton's, made him a lot better. Yeah, I mean, relative to as bad as it was last year, where he was like one of the worst starters in the league, he's fine. I mean, he's probably like quarterback twenty-two this year. And I'm not even talking statistically. I'm just talking about when you watch him. And like you said, who wants to watch that guy play quarterback? It was why it was tough when Peyton Manning's final season. It's like God, this guy's a shell of himself. I can't watch this. Neither could he. And it was over. Now, Russell Wilson can still play in the NFL, obviously, but I, I would expect him to not be on the team. And I would expect that to be over sooner than later when it comes to the offseason. I know you watch a lot of Niner games. I'm wondering if you notice Nick Bosa is always on the ground in pass rush situations. Seems odd to me, but whenever I watch him play, he looks like getting pancaked by tackles. Wondering if you notice it too. Is he having a down year? Uh... I think he's like the first guy to have, you know, through the first five years of his career, most sacks with like three other guys like Reggie White, J.J. Watt. Like, I, listen, I I think sometimes when you're really good, you get judged pretty harshly. Now, he can have games for being an all-time great player. I mean, I, I think he's going to go down as like a Hall of Famer where you're just like, God, I don't quite feel him and notice him as much. Here's the other thing. The 49ers defensive line is not as good as it has been. And Chase Young... Listen, for a late third-round pick, it's worth taking a flyer. But he's just kind of a guy. Like, he's solid. Uh, I'm not paying him much money in the offseason if I'm any team. And Eric Armstrong's out. Hargrave is kind of a situational player, good interior pass rusher. But Kinlaw is one of the worst defensive tackles in the NFL. And they just have a lot of other rotational guys. So it's pretty easy to kind of overload for Bosa. I'm not trying to make excuses for him. But he's, I, I think, relative to what he was last year, he just hasn't had the same season. Now, the 49ers guys argue that, you know, he has a bunch of, you know, he leads the league in pressures or he's up there near the league leading pressures. He gets held all the time. It's like, yeah, most good defensive linemen do. But I hear you. I mean, you, you, you can watch some games and you're just, you just want to feel his presence. And I would say when you watch some of the all, all-time great pass rushers, they just refuse to be denied in these big games. You know, sometimes Bosa can just, get neutralized bears fan here at what point do we start looking at matt Nagy as responsible for the kansas city offensive problems uh i mean andy reed controls the offense so whoever is the offensive coordinator for andy reed it's in kansas city specifically it's andy reed's baby and to their personnel like let's face it travis kelsey is kind of a shell of himself relative to like his all-time great status. He's no longer that guy. That has nothing to do with Taylor Swift. He just got old. You know, he's 34, 35 years old. He's been injured a lot. Clearly, emotionally, like I saw the clip this morning, him throwing the helmet, Andy Reid kind of bumping into him, trying to get his head in the game. And and that, that's, say this about Andy. Like, I don't care if you're one of the greatest players I've ever coached or you're a scrub. I'm going to coach you hard. I'm going to be in your ass. I, I'm not going to allow, he wouldn't allow the trainer or the equipment guy to give his helmet back. Uh, they got high standards there. And, and Travis, I, I think he's playing hard. Like, I think he's doing everything humanly possible to make plays. I think sometimes it's hard. And then when your next best receiver beside Travis Kelsey is Rice, like, it, it's a problem. It, it really is. And let's face it, like, what happened to you? Mahomes was just bad. He just wasn't good for his standards. He still he still can keep plays alive and puts them in position, but their wide receivers – don't make any plays. And then I think he gets frustrated, kind of overcompensates and throws some of the bad picks. I mean, the pick on the out route to Jones was just, that's like Derek Carr level throw. Patrick Mahomes does not make that throw. Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, those guys, it's it's weird when you see 
that play happened to them. And I, I do think that he just, it's kind of all coming to a head. And sometimes, listen, they've been to three Super Bowls in the last five years. They've won two of them. This guy's won a couple MVPs. You just have a down year. And if your down year is host a playoff game, win a playoff game, and still and get bounced in the second round, think how many teams would sign up for that. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that, like, you have a bad year next year. They kind of reload this offseason that they sign. You know, I'm not saying this guy specifically, but, you know, convince like a Mike Evans type, take a little less money, come play there, draft some skill guys. They'll be fine. They're not going anywhere. They're just having one of those transitional years. It's time for the parade in Pasadena. Tradition meets college football action in one epic bowl game. And with DraftKings Sportsbook, you can make every play count. New customers can score 150 instantly in bonus bets just for betting $5 on college football. Download the app now and use code JOHN. New customers can score 150 instantly in bonus bets for betting just 5 bucks on college football. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code J-O-H-N. John, the crown is yours. I'm terrified that Eberflus will not, the Bears will not fire Eberflus. And I'm extremely terrified that they do not fire Getze for the lack of ingenuity, lack of motion, terrible play routes, and ability to adapt adjustments Caleb Williams or any other quarterback cannot play under his play calling in the NFL. It's horrific. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I, I think the Bears are a wild card, man. I, I, I really do. You know, it, I, one thing that kind of bothers me is this Kevin Warren, the president uh, of the Bears, who they hired from the Big Ten, just now has carte blanche. Like, he has all the juice to run football. That's who the guy you're treating like he's like Al Davis or Phil Polian. He just gets to be the boss and just everyone answers to him. Like, I, I would say this. That's a huge fucking red flag. Whether it's Eberflus, whether they fire him, and, you know, Harbaugh would not work for Kevin Warren. Belichick, Mike Tomlin, they're not working for Kevin Warren. Like, I'm answering to you. In what world, as an as a football coach with a track record, do I have to answer to you? It would not happen. Get, get the fuck out of here. I, I refuse to deal with you. You're the guy that wanted to cancel football. He'd be like, well, the president said it wasn't me. Bullshit. That, that guy is such a fraud. I, I, I have a huge red flags on the Bears with that situation. And until that situation is handled, like if everyone has to answer to him, like he, listen, we, we can make fun of owners all we want. Like, hey, man, that's the thing. Like right now, the, you know, the Brandon Staley and Telesco had to answer to John Spanos, who is Dean's son. Listen, they own the team. They, they can do whatever they want, right? I, whether it's right or wrong, like it's still their prerogative. It's another thing when you you hire a guy who's an administrator and that person has to answer to. I don't I don't I don't feel comfortable with that as just someone who thinks like, are they going to have success? I, I would bet against it. And it speaks to the ownership, uh, not having a great feel and clue what's going on. And I, I think they got major problems until they figure that out. So whether Eberflus comes back or they try to hire another coach, if they got to an answer to Kevin Warren, I, I don't know if much is going to change. I'd like to know your opinions on how penalties, specifically defensive pass interferences and holding, I'm of the opinion that those should be 15 yards from the line of scrimmage for DPI and five yards for holding, but take away the automatic first downs. Yeah, I've said forever, the pass interference, they should copy college, right? Like in the one thing I like with the pros that's different in college is the one foot, two foot. Like it's the pros, you should have to get two feet down. And obviously that costs a lot of catches over the course of a year. No issue with that. One thing college got right, is you can't just throw up an absolute Hail Mary pass when the wide receiver or defensive back have no chance of catching it and get 50, 60, 40 yards when your offense has been terrible. And that happens all the time in the NFL. So I would have absolutely no problem with changing <clears throat> the 15-yard penalty you know, to a 15-yard standard penalty. No at the point of the penalty. Like, that that would get I, – I totally for that. I've always said defensive holding – you know, and defensive holding is such a subjective coin fit flip play, even to me more than pass interference. How often on like third and 10 or third and 15, is there a defensive holding, which close to the line of scrimmage, where the DB is kind of like fighting with the wide receiver, automatic first down, that should be a spot foul. So wherever the holding took place, you get third. If it was third and 12, well, now it's third and seven. You, you don't get an automatic for, I, I despise that play. Holding, I'll be honest, I haven't really thought of. 
My only issue with that is holding is a pretty big deal when it's called correctly. Like the reason I'm holding as an offensive lineman is because you would have sacked my quarterback. And when you sack my quarterback, it could lead to a fumble. It could lead to maybe you sack the quarterback as he's throwing. It gets tipped. It's a pick. Like it's, it's a pretty, you know, I, I have no issue with that, but but I'll be honest, I haven't thought that much about it. Uh, love your content, which I uh, have currently gotten out of college football, in which I coach for 15 years. I will be joining the Bald Head Club in the next week or so. Welcome. Any advice? I think for two years, I shaved it with a uh, with like an electric razor, so it only got to a one. I had more hair early on, so when I was bald, it didn't look as terrible. And as I've gotten older, uh, less than a year away from the big 4-0, it's kind of crazy, I started using, I, when I say older, probably you know, two, three years into shaving, I started using just the Mach 5 or Mach 3 and shaving my head. And now I shave my head every couple of days, and uh, I'll never look back. I've said this forever. Uh, it's obviously very expensive to get hair implants. And I've had a couple buddies that did it, and they said that it was the most painful experience of their life. Like, you're in tears just sitting there. It's not, one, guaranteed to hold, and two, you just get your old hair back. And my thing is, I would come back to be a hair guy if you could guarantee me, like, high-end hair. So my hair would flow like I'm, you know, Brad Pitt or George Clooney or, you know, Tom Brady. But if you just get any, his hair plant, see, his hair was good. So when he was losing it and gotten, got the procedure, it just added his own hair. They just take out the hair from your sides and put it on top. My hair was okay. You know, it was kind of coarse, didn't flow that well, had a lot of different calyx. I, I, I wouldn't want my old hair back. So I'd have no problem coming back. I just want new hair. I want new flow. And if you can't guarantee me new flow, I'm not coming back. So shave it, let it rip. If you can, grow a beard or whatever. Now that I don't coach, I've gotten into betting and was wondering what resources you use other than your main man, Stucky. Stucky's probably my main man. <laughs> other than that, I'm, I'm a big eye test guy. I, I'm not... I, I do gut feels. Now, I, I bet, you know, typically one or two big games a week, depending, you know, early on in the season, you get pretty excited because football's back. Late in the season, you kind of pick your spots toward the playoff run. But, like, I'm going heavily on Washington against... Steve Sarkeesian. And it has nothing to do with like, I'm not breaking down matchups. And it's just like, I'm just betting on Kalen Dubor with 30 plus days of rest and coaching time and preparation period to outcoach Steve Sarkeesian. That's my logic. <laughs> That's my, <laughs> it's period point blank end of story. So I, I'm a basic, like, I think sometimes you can overthink it. And listen, Stucky's so deep into the weeds and he's been fucking hot. So like when he's giving me these nuggets and he's on fire, I just write them, right? But I, I don't break down the individual. I think sometimes too, we overreact to injuries uh, with positions. Like, oh, this right tackles out. Like ultimately it doesn't move the line very often. But if you watch football at the level in which we all do, it's easy to like, oh, they're missing this wide receiver. Oh, Tyree kills out. How are they going to score against the Jets? And they score, they win 30 to 10. So you just got to watch a lot of football. That's how I do it in golf. I, I just watch a lot of golf <laughs> and I know who's playing well, who's not playing well and who's played well at these places before. And then I kind of bet on it that way. I'm a Patriots fan and was wondering what are your thoughts on a team rebuild? I think you should focus on building a strong core of players first and move up in the draft to target a quarterback with a high ceiling. My friend wants to draft a quarterback with the second overall pick. If we stay there, though, I agree quarterback is the most important position. Is it a waste to have your quarterback on a rookie scale deal during a rebuild? My first, my fear is we get an average starter and fail to put pieces around him in time to compete. Appreciate your thoughts. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Austin. I think there is no right or wrong way to do it. If you have a quarterback that you really like and you think he can be a really good player, you just have to get him if you're in position. Right. Uh, I, I just don't I think that's always going to be the priority. Now, if you you're not going to force a quarterback at a spot, if you don't feel comfortable, 
So to me, if like one of the quarterback, if you're drafting and the two quarterbacks you like are off the board and you don't think the other guy is a top 20 pick, take the best player. And then maybe in the second, third round, take a quarterback. I'm not against that. But I, I think when you force a quarterback, just like you could argue forcing other positions, you get in the spots where all of a sudden you regret the player. When you just take a good player, like a couple years ago, the Patriots took uh, Barmore from Alabama. She's a fucking stud. Just take the best player on the board. And I, I think if you continually speak, speak to that or stick to that plan, uh, and then take the quarterback when you feel right. Now, you, you're you going to have conviction on a quarterback. Dave Gettleman thought Daniel Jones was the uh, top 10 quarterback and drafted him six overall. It hasn't worked out, right? Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, like sometimes it fails. So that's the shitty part. Even if you like the guy, the, the history on that guy succeeding is pretty small. Got a lot of questions here. A lot of talk about the officiating lately. Obviously, there needs to be refs on the field to manage the game, but it's 2023. Why the fuck are we relying on them to make calls? It's not realistic to expect the refs to see everything when there are 200-plus cameras on the game. It feels like booth review is eventually going to be relayed to the refs almost every play in the future, so what are we waiting for? I think that expedited review that they're doing, uh, I, I've seen it in a bunch of games lately where, you know, they kind of, I don't even know if it's a challenge, if it's just automatic review and it's very quick. Like we all see it. Let's move on. Let's go. I, I hate the delay. I hate the time wasted. It's like, this one's pretty clear. Now some, because the rules have gotten in such a gray area. It's like, is that a catch? Is that, you know, it, it's hard to know, but I like when it's pretty clear, cut and dry, quick review, expedite it. Boom. Touchdown, no catch, you know, fumble, whatever. Let's move on. Like you said, it is difficult. To, I, I'm tough on officials. I'm a human being, though, and understand there's a level to that position, no, being in that position, that these guys are running four four forties, fucking shit's happening, flying. It's so much easier for us to judge it on the couch in slow motion. <laughs> it just is. I'm, I'm a tough on them, but I'm just tough because I'm just tired of getting it wrong. Can't we just get it right? And like you said, there has to be a balance because ultimately this is an entertainment product. But entertainment product that now we're betting on, a lot of money's on the line. So how do we strike the perfect balance of getting it correct, moving quickly? I, I, the, the NBA got it wrong. You watch the final couple minutes of a basketball game, you're like, I, I don't have 30 minutes. Can we just finish this fucking thing? I'm a huge Vikings fan, and I was wondering if you were the GM, what you would do at the quarterback position. I think the easy move is to try to bring Cousins back at a cost prohibitive number, like a number that we can agree on that isn't crazy, probably incentivize it based on the Achilles. <clears throat> now is Cousins because he's, you know, the best quarterback on the market by a mile. Now he's injured or some, would someone give him just one year, $30 million and just risk it. Cause I, I, I I'd struggle to give him like, Hey, I'll guarantee you like $15 million. And then we'll give you like million dollar game bonuses, you know, 500,000 for every start and 500,000 for every win. So if you're like a 10 win quarterback and you play a lot, boom, we can get 25, 30 million pretty easy and give a bunch of touchdown incentives. So if you're good, you want to stay here. There, there has to be, you know, this is a business. So I got to mitigate my risk of like, well, if it doesn't go well, I, I can't totally screw over the team. But I also know that if you're just 80, 85% of what you were, you're better than anything we can find. They're, they're in a very, very tough position. If the New York Giants end up drafting six to eight and miss out on the top two quarterbacks, should they trade up for Jalen, Jaden Daniels, or attempt to build an O-line and get weapons? You know the weird part about where the Giants are at? Is their quarterback, who I, I think I saw yesterday on the sideline watching the Eagles game, had to be him, is <clears throat> he's going to be on the team next year. And depending on, like, he could be healthy by week one. So are they, are they just going to have a $40 million backup if they trade it up to get one of these quarterbacks? That, that's my, what I wonder how this is all going to work. Was he bad enough that they're just totally out on him? And I'm meaning the owner. So do you just move up and draft a quarterback and then he just gets to start and Daniel Jones is backup? Or do you move up and kind of redshirt him a year? I, I don't know. 
I think it's a very, very tricky situation. It all gets back to Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones being a disaster and now injured is, you know, a, a massive curveball to the organization. Now, you could just argue the money spent, whatever, don't even worry about him, treat him like he's not even on the team. I think it's easy for us to say on the outside, but is that how the owner's going to treat it? Question Colts fans who now lives in Colorado, what the heck happened to Carson Wentz? Why can't this guy get a spot on a roster? Is he a bad locker room guy? He's on the Rams right now. Carson Wentz did. He He's on the Rams. <clears throat> I, I think in the NFL, it's a lot like high school or like an office where rumors, when they start spreading, perception becomes reality. And he had a lot of negativity surrounding him about the way people inside buildings viewed him. And that means the players and the coaches. Players, he didn't have many friends on teams. Uh, this is the rumors. And he wouldn't listen to coaches. So you get this rep of, well, the team doesn't really like him. And he's not that coachable. It's kind of a nail in your coffin as a player. Now, he had such rock bottom. Uh, I heard of a team last year. I got a story about they did research on a couple quarterbacks. He was one of them to be their team's backup. And they, they kind of sent in a mole to, to kind of talk to him, a football guy to talk to him and get some intel on where his head was at. And it was a lot of like, I'm getting screwed. And listen, that's, we've all had that attitude a time or two in our life. But there gets to a point where you no longer are a starter. The attitude kind of has to be like, hey, I'll do whatever it takes to help the team. I just want to get my career back, to train back on the tracks, and I'm willing to do anything to help anybody, especially a top 10 quarterback to be his backup. From what I was told, that was not the attitude. And this team uh, went with another guy because of that, because they talked to the other guy, and his attitude was exactly that what you'd like to hear out of a backup. And I think once you kind of make that transition from starting quarterback to backup, the attitude and the mindset has to change. Not of work ethic and trying at football and being prepared, but of how you approach when you walk in the building. You're not the alpha anymore. You're the beta. And I mean, when I say you're the beta, like people aren't looking to you not to be a good guy, to be a good teammate and all that stuff, to help the starting quarterback. You, you, you are essentially assistant coach that wears pads during practice. And I think that's hard for a lot of guys, especially guys that have made some money. It'll be interesting what happens to Derek Carr's career in the next couple of years. Uh, so I'm a Pats fan, and there's some decisions to be made. How come we don't hear about McDaniels going back to the OC and sticking with Bill for one more rookie quarterback cycle? Or on the other hand, wouldn't Jim Harbaugh be the best replacement considering his track record with winning everywhere he goes? Obviously, he's a top option for every team, but I just never hear this. It's hard to see Jim Harbaugh going to the Patriots. And it's hard to see the the crafts dealing with Jim Harbaugh. They just dealt with Belichick for a long time. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say if, if Bill Belichick's fired, mutually departed, traded, however it works out, Jim Harbaugh will not be your coach. I think the question is, will Gerard Mayo be the coach? Everyone says he's the coach in waiting. Is that actually the play? The, what's going to take place? Or is it just, are they having second thoughts after the season? You know, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think when it comes to Josh McDaniels, I can imagine Josh, who was just paid $50, $60 million to go away. It'd be hard to swallow your pride a second time and go back to Bill. He did it once, and it resurrected his career. Now, he's never going to be a head coach again. So he's going to go back to Bill and just be a coordinator the rest of his life? I think it's a lot easier if they went to the Chargers, or they went to the Bears, the Commanders, for him to do that. I think it's much more difficult to go back to New England. Just just put yourself in his shoes from a pride stand, from an ego standpoint. Regardless how everyone talks shit about you, how everyone's making fun of you, I, I don't know if I could do it. Got a lot of questions here. For the mailbag, I'm finishing up my undergrad at the University of Montana, the Grizzlies in the national championship and have always wanted to work in football scout coach in the media. Even I think the route you took from scout to media is ideal. I was wondering what advice you would have to give someone looking to get their foot in the door. Well, if you want to get in the media times have never been easier. Legacy media dies every day. And the, whatever this is podcasting, 
online. It's never been easier to do your own stuff. Now, to do your own stuff, you just have to start doing your own stuff. And when I made the transition from radio to podcast, I already had kind of a built-in audience. And then once I got with Colin, obviously, he opened me up to a distribution channel that is pretty elite. You know, It's a pretty big one, right? So it's like getting into Costco or something if you have a product. And I think the first thing you need to worry about if you wanted to go that route, start doing a YouTube channel. Start doing a, an Instagram every day. Make posts every single day. Every day, go on YouTube and post five, 10 minutes, whatever, whatever you want to talk about. Now, if you want to get into football, you went to Montana. Uh, you know, you have an opportunity to get in with the program. So I'll help with recruiting, I'll help do whatever. That's how I got my start at Cal Poly and even Fresno State. Like it's, it's a lot harder to get your foot in the door at Alabama or Georgia. You're in Montana, which produces a bunch of NFL guys, but it's still a small school. So it, it's never too late. You know, look at Mike, McDa Mike McDonald, Ravens, started working in college. And then ultimately it led him into the program there. So I, I would, if you want to work in football, just say, Hey, can, what can I help out doing? I, I want to work in recruiting. If you want to do media stuff, just start gi giving takes on Twitter, on YouTube, on Snapchat, on TikTok, on, um, uh, you know, all these different start a podcast. Now you, you're going to have to stomach no one listening for a while. Part of the deal. I, I do believe the cream rises. So if you stick with it for 10 years, you make something happen. Now you might have to get a job, do something else at the time. Uh, if that's the route you want to take, but uh, you just got to start. The faster you start and the less time you think about it, the the faster you'll get to where you want to go. But if you want to work in football, you're at Montana right now. I, I would, I would go up to Bobby Hoke at the end of the season when they, after they, you know, win or lose the national championship and say, I want to get involved. Listen, getting in an accident, is hard. Hiring Morgan and Morgan is easy. 35% of all fatal accidents occur between six o'clock and midnight. People age 15 to 24 had the highest rate of emergency room visits due to car accidents of all age groups. Morgan and Morgan is America's largest injury firm with over a hundred offices nationwide and 900 lawyers. Morgan and Morgan has been fighting for the people. For over 35 years, listen, we've all known people who have gotten to accidents and having good representation is key. Having someone that you can believe in and submitting an injury claim with Morgan & Morgan is so easy. If you're ever injured, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. Their fee is free unless they win. For more information, go to forthepeople.com slash John or pound law, pound 529 from your cell phone. That's forthepeople.com slash John or pound law, pound 529 from yourself. This is a paid advertisement. Mailbag question for the Pro Bowl. I definitely agree that it's dead and pointless. But I've seen boys ages 13 and 11 that love football, that want to watch it, and finally silly skill games and flag football entertaining. They don't have the sophisticated takes or opinions about the NFL yet, so seeing the big stars players silly things like they do uh, PE or at the park with their friends is fun. I agree. No, I mean, I'm telling you the, the reason they stopped, there was like this balancing act, the flag football thing. It, it was getting like six, 7 million people. Like yesterday on Christmas, nobody watched any of the NBA games as many people that watch flag football in the NFL. And there is a benefit. The problem is the players keep getting very hesitant to get injured, right? Tearing ACL, tearing Achilles. And I, I think there was just this balancing act. Uh, I, I never disputed the pe people watch people watch the pro bowl. So I, I don't know. I don't really have a good answer to how it's all going to work out, but it just, it's just going to go into, you know, the skills competition, which I still think is cool for the kids to watch Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen and Tyree kill and, you know, do stupid shit. Like your takes and interaction with Colin informed and relatable. As a Davis grad, I recommend a little work on reading of the ads. Cadence is a little off. Thanks, Stuart. We got <laughs> Stuart doesn't like the way I read ads. I literally, you just read what they give you. It's not, it's not that complicated, buddy. Uh, but appreciate the feedback. Listen, got You got to take the good with the bad. Been watching your show since Kyler Murray's Call of Duty contract, and I've been watching every episode since. With how serious football injuries can be. Do you think it's possible long-term 
the, and really quick on the ads, you know, we're sold out for a reason. <laughs> Do it does pretty well here. I, I'd say my ad reading, and I, again, I'm not trying to get defensive here, but we've had a lot of success within the advertisements, uh, given that that's what pays the bills uh, around these parts. So I, I'd say we're doing something right. Uh, I would say advertising, uh, dealing with our advertisers, uh, is a major, major positive uh, for this little operation that we call the Three Now Podcast with me. Again, reading, I'm always looking to improve. Cadence a little off. Uh, I'll work on my cadence for you, Stuart. Do you think it's possible that long-term the NFL could be shut down or at least seriously changed somehow? I just don't want to happen, but just somehow something I've wondered about. Oh, with how serious football injuries can be. I think this is the reason that they kick guys out of games. This is the reason they suspend guys without pay is simply because they don't ever want to get sued at the rate in which they got sued before. And they lost, I forget the exact amount, but it was clearly a lot of money. And you had everyone at ESPN, which was kind of ironic given that they were in business with the NFL, rooting for the NFL to shut down and end. It's like, are you guys fucking morons? Now, big J's get up in their emotions. But I, I do think that after going through that, and let's face it, I mean, for a long time, the NFL didn't care about anything, right, injury-wise, and it bit them in the ass financially. And just like any company that goes through something, well, they, they overcompensate the other way. Called, we all say it, CYA, cover your ass. And that's currently what the NFL is doing. They're in massive cover your ass mode. So even when a serious injury happens, they go, we have every protocol. Like Ultimately, it's a violent game. So bad things are going to happen. It's it's unavoidable. No different like boxing or UFC. This is not, you know, we're not playing softball here. This is a game where people get tackled by enormous men running really fast, trying to, you know, inflict pain when they hit you. This is not, this is a violent sport. Always has been, always will be. I don't even think they necessarily try to take the violence out. They just try to take the outcomes of the violence out. And through that, that they have pushed away from these headhunting safeties and linebackers. To me, the uh, protecting the quarterback is much more about the business of football, which is all surrounding the ratings. And the ratings, you know, pay for everything in the National Football League. And I think it's just a fine balance. And this is, you know, one of the bigger businesses. You know, it's definitely the biggest sports business in America. And it's it's become, you know, a powerhouse business in this country because it's the number one television show in this country. And they're making billions upon billions of dollars. They're signing $100 billion television revenue. All these teams are worth 5 to $10 billion. And I, I just think that they'll do whatever to protect themselves, as you or I would. That's what happens in business. That's what happens when you get money. You do things to protect it. You know, I start owning a couple properties. Me and my girlfriend were talking like, you know, I got to put some of this stuff in a trust. You ha you have to take different mindsets as life changes. And once upon a time, the NFL, you know, in the 80s was not some business behemoth as it is now relative to, you know, the rest of Fortune 500 companies, right? And I'm not saying it's valued like Google or, you know, some of these companies, but as a whole, as a partnership, which the NFL is, it's 32 entities under one umbrella, right? One individual team doesn't equal one of these companies, but when you add all 32 of them up, they're just, it's just a behemoth. And when you have a behemoth, you don't want to go back to, you know, backwards. You want to go forwards. And that's the way business looks at everything. You're growing, you're dying. You're getting bigger. And the bigger you get, the more you have to protect yourself. I would imagine a lot of people listening to this work for bigger companies. What happens to those bigger companies? You get sued a lot. Sometimes justified, sometimes not. And there's a reason, you know, I, I was taught a long time ago, the more success you have, the two people you need to keep very, very close that need to be very good at their job or your accountant and your lawyer. And that's advice that I think about a lot. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm actually kind of looking for a new accountant. Uh, not because mine's bad. I just I just need to get a guy that I, I want to have a presence where I can see him. My, my other guy lives across the country and I just, I need to, that's a story for a different day, but. Uh. Okay, let's ask a couple more questions. Also, question for the podcast. Uh, clearly, the Eagles are in for at least a semi-reset this offseason. Could you foresee a scenario which potentially Sirianni is gone 
in the next year or so. Obviously, right now, his record seems indisputable, but we've seen similar things happen with Super Bowl winning coaches. I think Sirianni, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna be the one, two, or three seed. So they're gonna host a playoff game. If they get the one seed back to back years, they get a free buy. And, you know, I, I would say if he doesn't win a playoff game, and let's just assume, let's just pick there the two or three seats. So they play wild card weekend. I think if he were to lose to the Rams, let's say he's the three seed and he plays the Rams and they went into the link and beat him, I think there would be problems. Now, I don't think he would necessarily be fired right away, but I think there would be problems. And I think 100% he'd be on the hot seat next year. I think there would be push to make an offensive coordinator change, which is the problem like, Nick, what do you do? Like, what is your role? And then the other thing would be, I just think, I would imagine Matt Patricia is just the defensive coordinator next year. And, you know, Sirianni's career would be tied to whoever his offensive coordinator is and Matt Patricia. And that's kind of feels what it's headed. Now, he wins a couple playoff games and he gets beat by the Niners or whatever in the NFC Championship game. It'll be fine. Back-to-back years, NFC Championship game, Super Bowl. Like, I'm sorry. Like, that's that's fucking pretty successful. Now, the Eagles, a high-standard place. They're used to winning... You know, they're trying to win another Super Bowl. Uh, they've been to a couple. They obviously thought this team was Super Bowl worthy. Maybe it's just not. And, you know, it's not his fault that everything happened with Jonathan Gannon and and Vic Fangio, right? But that did happen. And it, it clearly cost them a little bit. And now they got they got a lot of pressure, I, I think. No team has more pressure. Like, to me, the Chiefs, even if they're one and done, it's like, whatever. They've been to three Super Bowls. They've won a couple. Shit happens. There's going to be a lot of pressure on the Bills if they get in. A lot of pressure on the Dolphins, a lot of pressure on the Cowboys, a lot of pressure on the Eagles, a lot of pressure on the 49ers. Like, this is what this is. not everyone can win these games. And whoever wins, it's going to feel beyond devastating. And uh, fascinating to watch how it all plays out. So, listen, I, I, Sirianni is a fascinating case study. And I think, you know, these next couple of weeks, he should win both games against the Cardinals. And then he plays, uh, plays the Giants again on the road. So, you know, there's a pretty good chance he's going to win 13 games. <laughs> so it's like, he, wait, he won 27 games in back-to-back years, and it feels like people are on edge. That's Philly for you, too. I mean, this place, when they think they have a team that should be better than they are, people freak out. And that's because they do look a little weird. There, There is no disputing that, right? Like, whether you're an Eagles fan or not, if you just watch them, you go, they don't quite look right, even though they're not bad. And they got a t- – and part of it is they just have a ton of talent. They have a ton of offensive firepower. And when the quarterback looks solid, as he did yesterday for a lot of that game, it's just he's a he's a mother. I mean, he is. He's tough, man, because he can run. He's not super fast, but he's elusive. He's got a good arm. When he's accurate and the timing's on, he can make plays outside the pocket. Um, so if they, if they get that guy, they're, they're a very, very ski, scary team to play. Now their defense is just a major, major question mark, and now they're just tied to Matt Patricia. Can he save their ass? Time will tell.